Hello, I'm the Grub Street Blogger and I'm going to be looking at the books that I've read in November. And physically looking at the pile, I actually didn't realise how many I'd read. It's been a bit of a funny month really. Um, there's sort of been a theme to my reading this month and the theme is despair. So uh, <laughs> strap him for a jolly one. Here we go. The very first book I read was for the uh, Dr. Johnson book circle. It was called Travels, Travels? Letters Written in Sweden, Norway and Denmark. Actually, the full title is a little longer than that. It's by Mary Wollstonecraft, who has been in the news recently because they put a, uh, a statue of her in Newington Green. Uh, the statue is this big silvery thing with this naked woman on top, and people have been arguing about whether the statue fits um, her and herself and, and is a, is a you know, fitting you know, tribute to her, or whether it's um, a bit strange having this naked statue celebrating uh, someone who is known as you know one of the the, the first key thinkers thinkers of of feminism. It does feel like a very long time ago that I read this book, and I really really enjoyed it. Um, what it is is she's travelling around Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, which were all ruled by Denmark at the time, uh, and so Denmark. Uh, is, is the place with power, and then Sweden is a bit less, and then Norway is furthest away from that. Uh, and she's going into Norway, and she's saying about what she thinks. It's, it's travel writing, there's some nature writing, uh, and there's a bit of uh, her thoughts, her feelings, her philosophies sort of thrown in there as she's reflecting as she goes. And it's a lovely kind of book, a lot of it. Um, it's a book that managed to describe nature and the sublime and that feeling you get sometimes where you're just like, wow, the world is beautiful, um, in a way that's not boring. That's amazing. I've never read a book which described the sublime in a way that didn't bore me to tears. Um, Melmoth tried it a few times last month, and those bits were often a bit, oh, come on, I get it, you're looking at a waterfall. They didn't seem to evoke that feeling in me, they just, you know, and they, this sort of description often doesn't. But with Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft, it did. Uh, she's talking about the little flowers enameled on the, on the lawn and the rocks. And you really get a feeling of what she's feeling. And, you know, she's sitting in this boat and she's reflecting how there are times where she wants to be a part of all the people and times she wants to be separated. Now, I said my theme for the month was despair. Um... And there's a lot going on behind the book, which just sneaks out at times. She has committed or tried to commit suicide two weeks before she's gone on this journey. She's drank a whole load of laudanum. And about a month or two later, after this journey, she's going to jump off Putney Bridge uh, in another attempt, um, both unsuccessful. And she's on this journey to do some business deals for Gilbert Imlay, who is the father of her two-year-old child. Um, they're not married, but she sort of says she is, just to um, get by, to be honest. And uh, it, it's become quite clear that Imlay's no longer very interested in her. And he sent her off to do this job, and she's gone off to do it. And and there are, in the copy I read, the Oxford copy, some of her private letters at the back. And they are pained. She is in deep pain during this journey. She's taken her daughter with her, and she's fearing for her daughter. You know, how's my daughter going to survive? Um, if I educate her the way I think she should be educated, is she actually going to be fit for the world because the world is shit to women? Um, you know, there's all this going on. Then there's all this fervent of uh, the French Revolution, which has which has occurred, and all these new ideas and all this excitement. But also, you know, the bloodshed started, and so there's this whole coming together all the time of this deep optimism of the world's going to get better. And, and people are, are decent and things are going to happen. And then this deep pessimism of everything's shit and I want to kill myself. And the two just keep crashing and crashing throughout this book. And it's, as I say, none of it's exactly on the page. There are little moments, but it powers it. And it makes this actually um, a really moving book. It's... Um, it would be very good if I'd just read it and hadn't known any of this backstory, because there's there's obviously something going on underneath. Um, the the 
the thrill of the happy moments. There's, you can tell that these are special moments of escape for her because of the deepness of those beautiful moments. Because you feel that there's something going on anyway, even if you didn't know about it. And, and, and it makes the beauty shine all the brighter. Um, and of course she was to find love uh, and even get married, which she didn't say she would. And, and then sadly yeah, die uh, shortly after giving birth to her second daughter, Mary. And that first daughter, the one taken on the um, on the journey, most likely killed herself as well. I mean, this is the, there's a lot of unhappiness around this book. But the book itself is not an unhappy book. It's um, she says, "I will grab my moments of joy because I don't know whether I'll feel despair tomorrow." And it's that's what this book is. It's grabbing the moments of joy. Um, and <laughs> We're going to get a lot less joy as we go on, I'm afraid. So that was the first book. The second book is a very unusual book. This is just out. Um, I saw it um, a post about it on Twitter, and I was like, I've got to get that. Now, I'm a huge Christopher Smart fan. Um, anyone who reads my blog will know this. Uh, I have read pretty much everything uh, he wrote, <laughs> including midwives and things. I haven't read... Like his other articles he wrote in the Universal Register and things. He he wrote essentially uh, magazines and poems. Um, and I've read uh, pretty much every biography you can find. I've tracked them down, you know, 50 quid. All right, I'll have it because there's so few of them. There's there's not a lot of Christopher Smart uh, around, you know, stuff about him and, and such. So something extra was lovely. Now, Christopher Smart is probably most famous now for a little poem called My Cat Geoffrey, uh, for I shall consider my cat Geoffrey, for he is a servant of the living God, for daily he blah 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 blah. And it's a, it's a description of his cat, and about how he loves his cat. Um, but it's also a description of how he's watching the cat do catty things, and in doing catty things the cat is worshipping God through catness, essentially. Being a cat uh, worships God. Um, and this is a biography of Geoffrey the cat. Um, of course, most of it's made up because the only thing known about Geoffrey the cat is this this couple of pages of poem. Um, so our Geoffrey the cat is born in a cattery, aka a brothel in Covent Garden. And sort of, of course he is, because it's the most fun thing you can do. You know, he's born in a brothel in Covent Garden. He romps around. He sees theatrical people. He sees the king. You know, a cat may stare as a king. Um, and he, um, his favourite toy uh, used 18th century condoms. Um, there's a bit where as, as he was under the bed, his mistress was under a colonel. You know, you get to play... It's, it, it, you, the, there's a bibliography in this, and it's the only bibliography I've ever seen where I've read all the books in it. And, and that first half... But, Borrowing very heavily from Harris's List and uh, Halle Rubenhold's Covent Garden Ladies, which is one of the first books about the 18th century I ever read. Uh, so that's sort of that part. And then through shenanigans, uh, Jeffrey the Cat ends up in an asylum, a private asylum, where Christopher Smart is. You see, because Christopher Smart's career can broadly be broken into two. In the first half, he was a he was a university wit. Uh, who was too sort of earthy for the university, he ended up getting married, leaving it. And, and he did all these funny poems and serious poems. He, yeah, he just wrote to make money. Um, and he founded a, a magazine called The Midwife, I got those there, where he pretends to be a midwife. And then he started putting on shows where he's dressing drag as a midwife and um, run these drag review shows. And then he got very sick. And it's a bit, the details are very, very fuzzy. But when he recovered, he wrote this poem dedicating himself to God. And it would seem he followed through with that. And he took the the, the exhort, exhortation uh, by St. Paul to pray always and whenever it strikes you, uh, completely literally. And he would just stop in the middle of the street and pray and get people to pray with him and pray very loudly. And um, he became a problem. I mean, he was always an alcoholic as well. And uh, the, the admission he had in the first mental hospital was actually more about his alcoholism than this praying thing but they declared him uncurable so he ended up for seven years in a madhouse uh, whether he was mad or not i mean who can say so here he is uh, he, he's isolated uh, 
uh, he's alone. He gets visitors. It's not a you know, it's not a terrible bedlam, you know, horror gothic madhouse. You know, he has a little room, and it's probably not very comfortable and not very well heated. And he gets the occasional visitor, and you know, sometimes people do force themselves on him. And he, he talks about people working him with their harpoons. Um, that's a little mysterious. It's suggested in here that there was a sort of a mouth opening thing that they force medicine down. Um, but but largely it's a, it's a quiet, dull, monotonous life. <laughs> uh, worse than lockdown because <laughs> he can't leave. He goes out in the garden and he, he, he plays with his flowers and he plants some things. But his main companion is Jeffrey the cat. And so that's that part of it. Um, and he writes this big, long thing called Jubilate Egno, which starts off as this sort of experimental religious poem. But then as it goes on, it just becomes a way of him keeping the day, going through his own mind, sort of self-therapy at times. It's It becomes a sort of working document of him working his way through every day of this confinement. And then uh, he gets out of the confinement. Um, somebody just comes in and picks him up, essentially. And he's not in the madhouse anymore. But he still has a reputation for being mad. And this is affecting his poet, you know, sales. And he's writing and writing and writing, but they're just not selling. And he's getting poorer and poorer. And he ends up dying penniless. Uh, Jeffrey, in the in this book, ends up being taken away, and he dies in the country. It's a very simply written book that manages to conjure an awful lot up. Um, I think this is a really good introduction to some aspects of the 18th century. The idea of the the Grub Street writer, the hack writer, uh, Christopher Smart himself, uh, the idea of uh, Covent Garden and that kind of milieu. Ooh, being French. Um, and then just this sweetness. Um, you know, he's alone, except for the cat. And the cat was important enough to write a part of his poem about. And that cat has then seen through history to, to come into this book. And it's very... Uh, sweet and charming and, and quite moving, really. Um, very lovely. I, I heartily recommend someone yeah, you go out and get this. It won't take you long. It's a, it's a very, very simple read and it's just, it's just really nice. Um, but nice with that slightly melancholy element to it, which just deepens it a bit. It's very good. Very good. Okay, so... Our next book is Melmoth, and you're thinking, oh, I've already read Melmoth. Well, this is the, it's a reboot, actually. It's like, it's like Jurassic World. It mentions Melmoth the Wanderer in it uh, as a sort of misunderstood version of the real Melmoth. And the real Melmoth is a woman, and she, uh, she was one of the people who saw Jesus uh, resurrected in the garden. And instead of uh, telling the disciples, she said, no, no, I didn't see Jesus. And so she's cursed to wander forevermore to be the witness of all the sort of terrible things especially quiet terrible things when people who could speak up don't speak up and the main character gets involved in this story and starts reading stories about Melmoth and at the same time feels that Melmoth is following them because of their their life history and their sort of um, background and I think this is better than the original which I you know Sarah Perry I read the Essex Serpent and um there were many things I liked I liked the characters I liked uh the a lot of the story um I didn't like the writing which is the bit everyone says is brilliant I didn't like it I found it really really sort of self-conscious it was trying to conjure up images of um you know misty Essex you know, wastelands, and all it conjured up in my mind was the author sitting at her desk going, right, how do I create a really interesting way to conjure up a, a misty Essex wasteland? And this falls into it sometimes. Uh, there was a bit where they go, uh, she felt a banging on the drums of her ears. You think, eardrums then. Um, and, and then she has this habit, which she doesn't do as much in this, where she describes people in terms of what they're not. So if I'm describing me, I'd be like, he's not tall, He's not thin. Uh, he's not lusciously maned. Uh, <laughs> he's not attractive. Um, you know, it's not describing what someone is, it's describing what someone is not. And I find that very irritating. But 
there was very little of that. And in fact, the writing did what I think a writing in a novel should do. It, I don't think you should read a novel four sentences. I think it's to, to be taken in one go. Um, yeah, you can't take it in one go. You have to read it sentence by sentence. But you don't know the novel until you finished it and you have it all in your head. And one of the reasons I do these videos and write things up is to, to consolidate that and work out, right, what was that novel like or that book like? Um, and there weren't those, those those showy sentences, particularly, that were slowing it down. It was a really quite gripping tale. Um, and I really uh, got into the stories within the stories. And it's much better stru structured than Melm of the Wanderer. And it keeps the Melmoth character um, mysterious, but also establishes a more firm backstory. So Melmoth the Wanderer, you never quite understood his deal, but you were in his head for half the book or a big chunk of the book. So you kind of got his thought processes, which were weird and whiny, but not really exactly understanding how he got where he got and what he's trying to achieve. With this one, you, you're told exactly who she is, where she comes from. She's this person who saw uh, Jesus resurrected and said uh, and denied it. But you never get in her head. She's always this mysterious figure. Um, and there is a sort of, you know, was it true, was it not type thing at the end. But there were enough things to say, no, it was true. And the characters, I've heard people say they were a bit bland, especially the main character. But the main character is self-denying because she's... she's uh, She's guilty, and so she's living this bland life. Yeah, you know, she has this this house. Uh, she she rents a room, and the person she rents it with is this ninety odd year old lady who's you know got a great zest for life, despite the fact she's you know very very old. And she loves colours and sweet things and cakes and things. And then she's got this austere, very blank room. And blank rooms are really a thing of this month. Uh, you know, Christopher Smart was in his blank room. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft went to a number of blank rooms in her inns. This is another blank room. Um, and, and, and she's purposely not enjoying life. She's, she's denying herself the joy of life because of the guilt she feels. And then, you know, does she address it? Uh, does she go off with Melmoth? That's... You know, I'll leave, it's still quite a modern book. I'll leave people to discover that for themselves. But I think it was much better than The Essex Serpent. I think that's not a general consensus. I think people generally prefer the other, but I preferred that. It was uh, less precious. Uh, it had a slightly tighter plot. And I really did like the mood and the atmosphere. It is set in Prague, but now. And so it has this gothic, but also this sort of slight shrug in the gothic. It, like, I've lived in York, and it's sort of, you walk around, and a bit of you's going, yeah, this place is beautiful. But a bit of you's going, ha, it's just home. I, I'm too cool to be impressed by you know, these beautiful things I'm seeing every day. It has that kind of element but about the gothic. So it's, oh, it is creepy and gothic, but also, no, nah, we're too cool for that. And it, it has its cake and eats it in that sense. And it's it's good. I really re recommend that if you, uh, if you like the Essex Serpent, I think it's better. If uh, you like Melmoth or are interested in the idea of Melmoth, I think this is a better take on that kind of subject. Melmoth just rambled, as I am now. So I'm going to move on to the next book, which was the last Patrick Hamilton book novel um, I have ever, ever going to read for the first time. This is it. This is the last one. And it's the first time he's really disappointed me. <laughs> I opened it up. My, my notes... Um, from opening it up, just say, "Oh, Patrick, what are you doing?" <laughs> all the all the little quirks and ticks and stylistic things that he'd been work, you know, developing in those first two books, which kind of were fun. Um, it got a little bit overboard in the second one, but the characters were strong enough. This they just take over, so everything is is. Um, capitalized he loves doing these capitals and he still does it later on but more judiciously this time it's everything and there are a few little zingers in it there's this bit that says you know um the main character's father is only important in this story in that he said he would live forever and didn't and you're like a few zinger but it's nestled amongst it, essentially he's trying to make every sentence a zinger it's, it's that sentence thing again and so um it drowns. The whole book drowns. There's just a, you know, this is from the first page, or was it the second page? 
It's the second page. And it's talking about this woman walking along the beach. I've even forgotten her name now. I mean, it does feel like a long time ago that I read this. Um, Jackie. Uh, she's a young girl. She's thinking about a life in theatre. She's walking along the beach. And she's thinking about the stories she's heard about managers. and Maybe like casting couches and things. And uh, it says here, her misinterpretation of managerial intention was but a preliminary misinterpretation. And you think, oh, what is that? That's... I mean, that does not come out the mouth, that does not go in the eyes, that does not go in the head smoothly. You've, you've over-egged your pudding, and it is throughout. Um, but it does have some good little bits. So she w wants to become an actress. Her dad's died. Uh, he was supposed to leave her everything, but turned out he had nothing, really. And so um, she's got to get a career, and she's decided theatre, because at home in Brighton, she was well loved and she was like the, the little star of the theatrical thing. So it's like, I'm going to become a star. And you know what? I'm not even going to be you know, big headed about it. When I go back and I'm, I'm yeah, the main lead of the Palladium or whatever, um, I'm not even going to you know, deny them. I'm going to say, hey, friends, come in. And so she goes up to London and she happens to meet someone on the train um, who is also an actor. And they get very close. And he helps her, and she starts her career, and they kind of fall in love. Except, the career bits were quite fun. The, it's, she starts off as a chorus line girl, and then she nearly goes into this sort of shit rep Shakespeare. And then instead she goes into these sort of shit uh, melodramas and things, where she plays the juvenile lead. And she does pretty well for herself, really. But none of it ever depicts that, that buzz of theatre. It's just this... Uh, here we go. I'm going to go on the stage again. <laughs> it was yeah. There was no joy in it. Oh, no joy this month. Um, oh, little moments actually, but not in this one. Uh, there was a very funny bit where they're talking about a battle, and they've got all these just local people in to be extras, and how there's a battle with 15 people, but about 60 people died in it because people really like pretending to die, and so they did it several times in the battle. And then that's good. And then this relationship, which I don't like because uh, the guy Richard, I never understood him. I thought he was going to leave her. I didn't think he loved her. Um, it turned out he did love her and he died of flu. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I was supposed to take that relationship seriously. Oh, okay. And then a couple of chapters later, she shacks up with his uh, richer uh, brother. So, uh, and yeah, it's very nothing. -y. The bit I did like was at the end, she, she's had this pretty decent career in theatre, but she's not become a star. And so she's got a choice, marry this richer uh, brother or stay on the stage. And she decides to marry the richer brother. And the moment she decides to quit her ambitions, she suddenly feels this joy in this. Oh, I'm using the word joy a lot. There is joy. <laughs> but she, this release... Um, this beautiful release from from her ambitions, and she's she's proud. She's failed, she says, but she's proud to have failed. She's she's strong enough to have failed to have said, right, this isn't going to happen for me the way I want it to. I'm going to quit now. Um, and I've had that about my writing a number of times. I thought, should I just quit? Because it, I'm writing stuff I think is really good, but it's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, people aren't. It's not being sold or anything. Uh, I don't have that strength to quit just yet. Uh, also, uh, she had more success in her acting than I've had with my writing before she quit. So at least let me have a crack at that. So next, that was sort of a section. I All of those books I forgot I read this month. I knew I read them and I remember the books. But I thought I'd read those last month. I thought this month started with Hangs a Man by Shirley Jackson. Um, Hangs a Man's a very odd book. It's her second one. It's about this girl who goes to uh, university and her life unravels. Um, it's in three parts. The first part is her at home and it reveals that her home life is not pleasant, really. Her dad is trying to live out his, you know, correct his um, intellectual and career failures through her and her mum is trying to correct her emotional failures through her and so she's just this vessel in which they pour their failure into and sort of demand her to do better and she's obviously a bit cracked because she has an imaginary detective in her head asking her questions about a murder 
and to clear herself of, of horrible thoughts. She imagines the Melissa being burnt alive. So she's clearly not quite there. Now, when she goes to university, that's not really a place a person should be if they're not, you know, as strong as they should be because uh, university has this habit of um, uh, unsettling the best of people. Uh, a lot of people go a bit funny at university uh, and, and there's all these vicious little bitter uh, cliques or well, it's an American book so it'll be a click but little cliques um, and she's not really part of anything she doesn't really have any friends uh, the closest thing is this desperately sad um, alcoholic former student she was a student last year but then she married the teacher and now this year she's a teacher's wife but the, the students don't accept her and the teachers don't accept her she's very lonely uh, and she gets friends with these two people who uh, probably having an affair with the teacher, and that's all very unpleasant. And then she just says, oh, there's, there's this, this interesting friend called Ashley. Ashley or Max? <laughs> I'm not good with the names today. Uh, she's called Natalie, I remember that. <laughs> Isn't she called Ashley? Come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Yeah, Ashley. Okay. And... And then she goes back to her parents and, and realises she can't settle back home. She goes for Thanksgiving, realises she can't settle back home, comes back to university. And now, all of a sudden, this, this, this friend who we've kind of heard about is now her absolute best friend, uh, possibly her lover. They, they, they live together. Um, they're going for this walk and they're, they're playing these weird games, imaginary games where they're pretending they're businessmen going on trips and all of this. And then uh, the, 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 the friend leads her into this dark wood. And you think, what's going to happen now? And then she pulls it all back and and, and um, overcomes that. And you think, well, was this girl real? Was this girl not real? What you know, what was real? What was not real? It's all very, very unsettling and very, very gripping. Um, I preferred it to The Haunting of Hill House, which is the only one I'd read before this. Uh, it's, it's a book that, you know she's not quite there at the beginning straight away, but the the way the book's told is you kind of trust the telling of it until you start realizing, oh no, this is all being told through her. You know, it's not first person, but it's being told through her. And actually, the world might not look anything like the way it's presented in here. Uh, and it's 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 very unsettling, and it's a brilliant depiction of. That moment at university, I know I had it, where you, you suddenly think, well, who am I, actually? I've done these things and those things, and I'm from there, and I did that, but who am I? And that that sort of unravelling of ego, then the, then you have to tie all those parts back up and recreate yourself, I suppose. And it's a very um, gripping uh, depiction of that. So I thought I'd go, oh, right, I've done Haunting the Hill House Lady, so now I'm going to go for Woman in Black Lady, one of her other ones. It's called The Small Hand. It's a ghost story, as it says. A guy is um, uh, going, he's a rare book dealer. He's been with a client and he, he sees this, this sort of overgrown garden. And as he stands there, he feels a small ghostly hand touching him. And throughout the book, the ghostly hand keeps touching him and it gets less and less benevolent. It's trying to pull him into uh, deep ravines and pits and, and in some water. And it's essentially trying to make him kill himself. Um, and as the book goes on, we find out why the small hand has chosen him. Um, and it's, uh, it, I read the book in a day, it's a very easy read, but there's something, maybe it was because I read Shirley Jackson first, she was very, very rooted in this kind of uh, late 50s Americana, uh, when she was writing, thing, and it's very gripped and rooted, and then all the strangeness comes out of the fact that the things that you thought were rooted or in fact all over the place and in the air but this one the problem is it feels like a, a edwardian ghost story our main character is a uh, antiquarian bookseller there are the places include a monastery a college in oxford a lord there are people with names like hugo and things you you feel like you should be you know in a in a straight straight collar and it's all very edwardian but also they talk about the internet, so it's not. Um, and so it feels very removed. And so the, the creepiness is kind of, it doesn't grab you in that same way. So it was pleasant, 
um, it wasn't it wasn't a bad book. It was a it was a very nice not yeah nice actually. That's the trouble. It's a cozy ghost story, which uh, as Christmas comes, yeah, a few cozy ghost stories are good. But it was just a little too cozy to stick with me, especially um, this month when things like Hangs a Man and Melmoth have stuck with me uh, quite a lot more. That sort of fell by the wayside. Now, then I read The Sundial, which is another Shirley Jackson. And this one is uh, also very weird because <laughs> it's Shirley Jackson. Um, there's a family. They essentially wall themselves in this house. And then they're told that the world's going to end and only people who are in the house are going to survive it. And it's how that affects them. The trouble with this book is you start off with this very um, large family of people some of them with kind of similar names. And you've got to sort out, right, who this is, this person, this, they're related this way. They like each other. They don't like each other. They think they murdered that person. Uh, she actually likes her for murdering that person. She doesn't. And, uh, you know, and none of the characters speak, act, or feel in any way like a person does. And so it's very, um, you know, it takes a long time to get into this. And then just as you get into it, a whole bunch of other characters turn up. For very sort of minor reasons. One of them, she says, oh, my dad is out hunting lions in Africa, so I've come to your house. Uh, okay, okay. So then you have this whole other bunch of characters, none of whom think, act in any real way. But once you've sort of settled that, you've got a really interesting story about these very, very peculiar people um, who feel the world's going to end. And it's a really, really funny book. It's not a... It's not a light funny book it's a it's a pretty viciously dark funny book but it is really funny so there's this murder in the town um years before the book starts and the daughter is they all the whole town believed the daughter was the murderer and he she hit and killed her family with a hammer sort of a lizzie borden type thing but as you're being told this story it's really really clear she's not and that she hasn't you know she's completely innocent but the town makes money out of tourism from this hammer murder. So they all go, oh, yeah, see, she must be. Using these very uh, the very things that make it clear that she wasn't. That's kind of funny. And then there's another um, cult who believe the world's going to end. And that aliens are going to suck them up. But the alien machines have trouble with metal fastenings. And so you should not wear metal fastenings. And <laughs> the people in this book go, ah, oh, sorry, we can't be part of your cult. We just use loads of zippers. Sorry. And there's loads of really funny bits like that. And once I started establishing who they were and getting into it like that, it was actually quite a, an enjoyable book. Probably the funniest book I read this month. Um, definitely the funniest book I read this month. And uh, yeah, but it just, there was a lot of working it out to get in there. It was, it was You got through the impenetrable, impenetrable forest and the, the glade in the middle was quite quite lovely well not lovely lovely is the wrong word um this is vicious and horrible but it was entertaining okay next book this is this is where things take a bit of a turn um i've got three books left and they all kind of fit together and so i saw this month as sort of the ghosty story and weirdy story section and then the this section i had forgotten all about those other ones this month um it's called Savage Girls and Wild Boys. I bought it from a uh, charity shop for a quid, you know, a few months ago, I presume. Well, it would be more than that now because the charity shop's been closed for so long. But a little while ago, I thought, oh, I know a little bit about, you know, wild children from books of, you know, fantastical tales and things. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll enjoy that. And before I started reading it, I looked at the pictures because, um, yeah. So it's, oh, okay. Uh, boy from Moscow, Rose by Walls. Uh, oh, Peter the Wild Boy. We'll have John Arbuthnot and things in this. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's good. And um, uh, Victor, the Savage Boy of Avignon. Avignon. Not Avignon, but Avignon. Oh, yeah, they like the true faith from that's interesting. Oh, Casper Hauser. Okay. So I, I kind of knew uh, Amala and Kamala. I remember them from something. I kind of knew a lot of these people. And then the last one came. And I hadn't heard of her, and so I had a little flick and read about her chapter, and it was, um, it got me. Uh, it, 
It reminds me of when I went to Auschwitz. I didn't particularly want to go. In fact, where even when we got there, I, I was saying I, I might not go in actually, but I did, and I'm glad I did because the the tour guide was was angry and it was delivered very well and it was um, quite cathartic. But it was that kind of thing. I don't I don't believe in the metaphysical existence of evil or or things like that. I, I believe they're human constructs, but sometimes just something yeah you know, there's that little shard that little splinter and this of that th last story so i started reading the book from the beginning actually reading it now but as i'm reading it i'm knowing it's coming to this last story so i'm reading it with this thing as it goes now i'm not describing it much because i'm going to talk more about it later and so we had these um wild children these natural children children who um didn't have human language either because they were um, blocked from normal human company or they were cast out or uh, maybe they had some sort of uh, illness or um, you know, disorder or something which meant they couldn't uh, learn this sort of thing and then they were cast out and so Peter the wild boy and things like that the fact is no one is raised by wolves no one is raised by wolves what happens is a child is abandoned or kicked out and they're found near wolves. Um, the ones who had the most sort of wolfy abilities in this uh, probably learnt that before they even found themselves in this position. Uh, and it was heartbreaking, actually. It was about a whole, you know, it's about these children who were denied from normal human life and normal human company and people's responses and so it starts off with Peter the wild boy who was a bit of an interest for a bit they tried to teach him a bit it didn't particularly stick so they just let him live in the country and then you've got uh, Mimi who um, actually did do okay she learned French she was a French uh, she was found in France but she found living uh, in the French style, actually affected her health, and she was very sick for a lot of the last of her life, and she disappears from history. And then you got Victor, who, uh, again, a big case, uh, lots of interest about it. There's all this stuff about teaching him, and he started learning, and then it, it hit a plateau, and he was sort of packed off and forgotten about. And this is kind of the theme all the way through it. One that that romantic notion of, well, at least they had this life with the the wolves, you know. Not really, you know. They're just, they're just horribly screwed and mixed up human children who haven't been able to develop because of lack of opportunities, um, and then this inability with any society to be able to get them in and welcome them in, welcome them in, um, and and the stories are really interesting. And I would like to learn more about Victor. Um, that was a that was a very interesting one, and and his teacher Itar, Itar I guess because it's French so you don't there was Itard I don't know Itard, um, but hanging over this book the whole time was the last story in the book, um, and I I ordered a book about that last story because there wasn't enough in here to sort of cleanse me of that story. It just, it was, it was like a ghost. It was like a ghost. It was like a small hand. In fact, it, it kept grabbing me. I, whenever I was on my own, I kept thinking about this person and this situation. But while I waited for that book to come, I read another book called David Maloof and Imagine Me Life. And I read this because, um, uh, it's, it's about a wild child. So I thought, you know, I'll try and keep this theme, uh, going and this is about Ovid, the the Roman poet. He's been uh, exiled uh, off to Romania, actually. Uh, except <laughs> I had a little read about this book afterwards, and the Ovid is nothing like real Ovid, which I don't know much about. And the place he was exiled to was nothing like the real place he was exiled to. Uh, but hey, the point is he doesn't have the language of this place. He's cast out. He feels like a child, and then he starts learning to be with these people and then they find this wild boy who's been raised by deer he hasn't of course because no one is and then he takes this kid in and tries to teach him and <laughs> they just lift bits of victor the wild boy 
uh, the the general boyard. It's it's just nicked. One of the most lovely scenes in this is the the little boy sees snow, runs out and plays in it, despite the fact you know he's naked, but he's so happy with the snow. He's so ah oh, glorious. That was something Victor did. It's it's almost a direct rip. But then um, there's an illness that goes about, and Ovid and the wild boy get blamed for it. And so they run away. And as they run away, um, Hina has to learn off the wild boy how to live in nature. Uh, and then he dies. <laughs> it's it's the romantic version of this. This is distinctly unromantic. And each story gets less romantic. Uh, this is trying to have that myth of the wild boy. Um, it, was, it was a stopgap, but... It, it was a good one. Uh, and again, about beautiful writing. I read some reviews of this. Apparently, they make people read this in Australia because David Malouf is a big thing now. I've not heard of him. I just thought it looked interesting. Um, but uh, you can tell that they made people read it because there are tons of like one-star reviews on Goodreads going, this is shit. Oh, he thinks he's poetic. And actually, I I, I was reading it. I, I found it pretty easy and not uh, it wasn't like it was trying to be a poetic read. It was like it was trying to tell this story. Um, yeah. So I'm down to my last book. Uh, and I'm actually going to put a trigger warning. Because this last book deals with uh, abuse and neglect. And is heart-wringingly sad. Um, it's about the last case in that book. And this thing that, that haunted me um, for so long. It's, it's about a girl called Jeannie. Um, she's quite famous. I hadn't heard of her until I come across that book. And to be honest, I wish I'd never heard of her. I wish I did not know this. Um, this is something I would like to have been ignorant of. But having heard a little bit about it, I needed to know more about it. Um, so, uh, at the age of 20 months, this is in America, in the, um, well, I suppose it'd be in the late 50s, it starts. But at the age of 20 months, this, this little baby genie, uh, not her real name, is she's developing slowly and she's had this this complication from uh birth where the parents blood types didn't properly they kind of clashed as so she needed blood transfusion and so she's she's hit her dates a bit slow and the doctor has said that actually she's she's severely retarded is his words um about the same time the dad of this this girl her his mum has been killed in a hit and run accident and it's the car's driven off and has dragged her face off. It's that bad. And he's now hating the world. But he's got a house. And so he takes his son, who was also hit in developmental months late, because they're obviously not great parents, um, but is older now and, you know, actually flourishing. Not flourishing, but, yeah, you can see he's a normal kid. But this is still a baby. So they, they have this house. One of the rooms is a bathroom. One of the rooms is a kitchen. One of the rooms is the, the mum's bedroom, which is not touched. Uh, one of the rooms is the living room where the dad, the mum and the brother all sleep uh, and live most of the time. And one of the rooms is a small box room. And this box room is, I suppose, the nursery for, for the little girl. Uh, it has a cot, or it had a cot, and it had a, a potty chair, like a wicker chair with a, with a potty in it. And this little uh, almost two-year-old uh, baby was strapped to this potty chair uh, for nearly 12 years um, this girl from that age uh, 20 months to 13 and a half years spent most of her life uh, most of that you know her life up to then strapped on a potty chair uh, in a small blank room uh, with no nothing to um, engage her um, she could kind of move her arms, she could kind of move her feet, she could move her head. She was in this harness. Uh, she wasn't talked to at all. Uh, sometimes they'd remember to take her off the potty chair and put her in, lock her in this cot. Uh, as I said, this going right up to the age of 13 and a half years. Um, uh, she was fed baby food, but she was fed baby food so fast she couldn't learn to chew and swallow it so she'd just keep it in her cheeks and it would break down uh, she had a ring of calluses where she'd been sitting in this hole of the potty um, 
the mum had had enough uh, about something completely different, actually. She thought this was a completely OK way to treat the daughter because she was poorly retarded and she'd been looked after, I suppose, or she was too scared of the husband or whatever reason. But she'd had enough and she took this kid and they went off to get help for the mother's blindness and they walked in the wrong room and they saw this kid and they're like, well, it's like a five-year-old uh, autistic kid that's not been registered. And then they found out, no, she's 13 and a half years old. She's incontinent. She can't feed herself. She can't dress herself. She can barely walk. She walked in this very peculiar way because she was used to being tied down. Uh, so, so her walk was just, um, yeah, she couldn't physically focus beyond where the 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 the, the, the house the, the the room was, and she had absolutely no language because she hadn't had any stimulation or input. And this is the thing that's been haunting me. And this is the thing. I mean, I, not so much now, but over the last week, I, whenever I was alone, um, it would just come to me. Imagine what it was like to sit there for something like 4,000 days looking at a wall in silence. And she wasn't allowed to speak. If she spoke, she was hit with a stick. Uh, it's... I cannot conceive of anything more like hell. I I can barely imagine it, and at the same time, for a while, I could barely stop imagining it. It was um, it was one of the hardest. I I could, it would not leave me alone. It haunted me. This this is this image of this this girl just just looking at a wall on a potty. Occasionally, you know, highlight of the day, having baby food shoved in your mouth. It was, it was just so um, unbelievably unpleasant that I could not, could not tear myself away from it, uh, which is why I read this book. And so, actually, that's a very small part of the book because the book is about her, uh, what happened next, and, I mean. It's called a scientific tragedy. So, you know, this isn't going to end very well. But, so she's taken to the hospital and a team comes about. And, you know, there's this, there's a girl, she's 13 and a half years old and she hasn't had any language input. And it's about the same time that, that Chomsky and other theorists are saying that language is hardwired in the brain. And someone else whose name I've forgotten, I'm afraid, said it is. But it was a cut-off point, and that cut-off point is about 13. And so here we have a 13-year-old girl. If we teach her language, we prove them wrong. If we don't, we prove them right. And so they're seeing this girl, and they're seeing all these scientific scientific things they can do. And there are some voices saying, yes, but she's also a terribly damaged girl, and she needs to be looked after, and she needs to be loved. And actually, she needs someone to treat her like a baby, to wash her and clean her and hug her and just hold her. And she needs to develop that connection. Um, that's what she needs. She doesn't need words. She will, she'll probably get them if we do this, but she doesn't need them. However, it was easy to assess language growth. So that's what they went with. Um, and then they all started arguing. But it, despite all of this, she flourished. She, uh, within you know uh, months, she started being able to dress herself uh, and... and not you know mess herself and wet herself and and she started showing more engagement with things and um a couple of years went on and she gathered lots and lots of words she was desperately wanting words uh, and, and she became this this communicator a brilliant communicator but non-verbally so the the things where they were saying it was almost like magic because people would just walk up to her and give her something she wanted or they would buy her things she wanted, without her ever having to say anything. She could just communicate like this. And she's obviously, she was obviously, she is, a, at this time, she was obviously a very engaging person. Um, you know, she wasn't, you know, she used to spit and rub it in her hairs, and she used to, you know, she was messed up, but she wasn't an idiot. Um, they, they did tests and, and, and things about what, with her right hemisphere, she was having an adult level, even as she had in other things a toddler level of development. Um, and, and it was 
it you know there's this moment of flourishing in this it's, it's, it's really glorious but it it reaches a plateau like victor and they now think that the reason there's this plateau is because our brain is actually activated by language part of it the, the left hemisphere is organized by language by hearing language um and so we need language to develop and so that part of her had not developed it said it was almost as if she'd had that hemisphere taken out it just was not useful so she's developing this all in the right hemisphere and she's obviously really really intelligent in her right hemisphere and she can't she can't make a coherent sentence she can't put logical things together because the, the right is not doing those jobs but with words with a bit of sign language with pictures with gesture she can communicate and she's beginning to connect with people then the money runs out and everyone sues each other over it and she ends up lost in the system uh she goes to a foster house where she's beaten because she vomits and from then on for a long time she does not talk because she does not want to open her mouth in case vomit comes out um she uh you know <sighs> she's still alive this this girl she she's now 60 years old uh, she lives in a home somewhere for for you know adults with with you know severe learning and mental disabilities who knows how she's doing who knows how she thinks but the the the, the tragedy the scientific tra tragedy in it is that one they could never get her to be you know i want to say normal but you know she's lived in hell literal hell as far as i'm concerned for 13 and a half years and and you carry it with you um and then their focus on, on the language, which gave all sorts of very useful data in the end. But how much did it help her? Yeah, and she did connect with people. But if they'd just, if they'd worked on that, if they'd had that connection, if she, if she could almost be raised again, I don't know. Uh, it's a story of lost opportunities. Um, and a story of someone who seems quite remarkable. Imagine... You know, the, the people talk about all talk about how engaging and how quick and witty she was and also you know she was not she was messed up and she was not like other people of course but you just think you know when she was strapped in that chair at the age of 20 months and she she was a normal baby maybe it was hitting some marks slightly late I mean, I hit my marks late because I was premature, you know. But she was a normal baby. She could have developed into a normal adult. Um, instead, she had 13 and a half years of hell, this flourishing moment, and then this sort of slightly, I don't know, maybe actually she's stimulated and maybe she is happy with her. I, you know, you can't tell, can you? You don't know. She, she's kept from the public eye. She, you know. Maybe it isn't as sad a story as it, as, it, as it seems to be, but but even if even if it wasn't the ending that's that sad, it's that it's that deprivation and that monotony and that uh, that image of hell is is of of being strapped. I so I read this book in order to exercise it, in order to be able to let her go, uh, and doing this little video and I know it's the longest of these because apart from anything else there were way more books than I realised um, is it, it's always just part of that uh, it's amazing I don't think I'm ever going to be quite the same again you know not in any big you know I'm not being hugely dramatic around. just just in that little way just in that little there's that little thing there there's that little thing that I know that I I wish I didn't know, but now I know it. It's, it's it's there. That one that this is possible, but also two. The amount of growth and the amount of joy and it, I mean, the joy and the amount of love and that is still possible after that and the the human spirit and well, I say this is a month of despair. That pretty much all these books involve someone despairing. Uh, yet. 
there are moments in all of them of joy. And I go back to the first book of the of the month, this book here. This is a joyful book. And it's a joyful book written in the middle of despair. Um, the poet Christopher Smart, where is he? Uh, is Christopher Smart. In fact, I think there's a picture of Christopher Smart in here. List of illustrations. So when Christopher Smart was... Um, he he was out of his uh, his imprisonment in, uh, for seven and a half years in a, in a mental in a private mental hospital, which again is that kind of similar thing to the genie in the room, except less. Um, but when he was out, he uh, had to write loads because his stuff didn't sell as well anymore. And he wrote the last poem he wrote was called "On a um, On a Bed of Guernsey Flowers." This is Christopher Smart, by the way. Uh, in better days um, and it's all about these flowers that bloom about this time of year hang on there we go that is a painting I did of them and they bloom about <laughs> not a very good painter but they bloom about this time of year um, and it, he's saying about how he sees these flowers as he's walking and they remind him of when a friend comes to tea unexpectedly and he has a bit of a uh, social uh, moment. Because he's a very sociable person who'd been locked in a madhouse for seven years and then kind of ignored afterwards. So so these, these beautiful late-blooming flowers are, are like like a friend coming uh, uh, at the end of uh, you know, a lonely day. And um, he remarks on this, and he's talking about that that's what life is. There might be this... This terribleness, this flatness, and I know a lot of people are feeling it at the moment. But there are those moments of joy and those moments of shining brilliance. And the poem ends with, um, We never are deserted quite, it is by a succession of delight that love shall find his way. We never are deserted quite. It's that quite which I think makes it true. Uh, I'm moving. Maybe we may feel like we're deserted. I actually don't. I, I'm. A, I've had a. I, you know, um, I. You know, I, I've been talking to family and friends, and I've had quite a nice week. But reflecting on these things I've read that have deeply uh, moved me this this month, um, we never are deserted quite. And that's why I'm going to leave you. Sorry for talking so long. <laughs>